Okay. <clears throat> deep voted, deep, deep voiced Jeff. <laughs> but you were going to say deep throated Jeff. <laughs> Cut that. Made it point. Yes. <laughs> oh. Cheers, Sam. Cheers. Nice to see you again. It's been a while. Mm. It has, actually. Yeah, apologies to our podcast subscribers. We, um, maybe a failure bow is due. We've, yeah, we've been a bit slack, haven't we? Well, not so much slack, but we, we did fail in our recordings. We did have one due to go out, but yes, the quality was not high enough. Yes, didn't meet our definition done. We, we asked various experts to come in and help us with it in post-processing, but we couldn't get it to a point where it was releasable. Um, so to spare your ears, we decided that we wouldn't release it. Uh, but that meant, obviously, you went uh, a fortnight without an episode from us. So it's been a month um, since we last were on air, I think. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, but we're, we're back with a vengeance, and it's uh, Halloween time. So I've got a pint of Wicked Witch. Nice. Which is a, it's quite dark. It is quite dark, mm. yeah. Uh, away from the IPAs. Um, and this is more of a... It's not quite a stout. It's, it's, it's more watery than a stout. It's lighter than a stout. But it's, it's a dark, dark ale, I would say. Um, my taste buds aren't great because I've got a bit of a cold at the moment. Yeah, you sound like you've got a bit of a cold. But it's, um, it's quite fruity in a way um, and I kind of associate spice with uh, late autumn yes. early winter uh, and I think a, it's not really spicy but there's an undercurrent of spice in there that you think okay that's a really diluted um, what's the word it's like Christmas wine type yeah. but, but yeah, like in a beer yeah yeah um, and it's nice, it's, it's not fizzy at all. It's a little bit Ribena ish in colour, actually. You hold it up to the light. Mm. Black currant, that is, for our non UK audience. How about you? I've gone for um, a pint of Freak Show. It's probably Halloween themed. Mm -hmm. But you seem to think I've had this before. I think either you or I have had it before. It's, um, it's a Col Cotswold cider. Um, so, um, product and it's 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 nice, cloudy, very cloudy, um, no fizz to it at all. I tell you what, here's an idea. Sorry to interrupt. If any, if we have had freak show on the podcast before, and anybody can tell us, the first person to tell us the episode that it was in, if they're right, we will send you an agile podcast T-shirt. <laughs> there, there you go. go. So cloudy Instant competition, cloudy, um, flat. Um, um, it's it's. I mean, it's not that strong actually. It tastes. It doesn't taste, hardly taste strong at all. It's got a bit of quite an agricultural taste. Mm. Some quite a scrumpy. Bit, bit of dirty taste. Mm. Not 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 in a bad way. Just in a bit more of a rough taste. Mm -hmm. Do you like that? No, I think I prefer something a bit cleaner, a bit crisper. Okay. You like the glass then? Yes. Yeah, so we've got. Um, for the benefit of people who can't see the video, it's a Cheltenham 2019 Real Ale Festival glass. It's specially printed for their, their their festival. And we are in. This is it's got the whole. It's got the pub on the glass as well. We're in the Sanford Park Ale House in Cheltenham, so we do like our real ale in Cheltenham, um, and they have their festivals. Although this is a cider. <coughs> when was the festival? Yeah. Well, oh, they had more than one. Doesn't say here. So I don't know which one it was. But given the fact that it's got a witch on there, I would say it was the... It must have been sort of recent. <coughs> it was the, the half-term sort of halloween -y festival rather yeah. than the spring one. So, yeah. You know, did, you, did you get up too much for Halloween? Did you do, do you do Halloween? I do, yeah. I like, I like getting dressed up for Halloween. I, I go all out. Those of you will... Uh, perhaps some of you will remember my costume from a couple of years ago. I actually gave a, a talk at a... That was in Dublin, wasn't it? In Dublin, that was in Dublin. Dressed as the Joker. Costume and makeup and but this silver wasn't teeth. this wasn't whacking Phoenix Joker. This <clears> was um, well, who was it? Who was the guy? Je Jared Leto. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I haven't seen the new one yet. Still. Yes. So um, no, it was uh, and uh, my wife went as Harley Quinn. Uh, so that was our get up two years ago. This year I went as uh, a werewolf. So I had I had the eyes, the contact lenses, and the fake teeth stuck on teeth and. Um, 
How long were you Close. playing this year? Uh, about an hour and a half, two hours. In the seat? Uh, on and off. So a bit of costume, a bit of makeup, a bit of hair. <laughs> yeah. It's good, I like it. And had a, had a good night. Yeah. Good night. So yeah. this was this was what was the best in show at that party you were at? What was the what did you say? Well, was there, the there was best some, costume you saw. There was a very very good Freddy Krueger. Was there? Very good Freddy Krueger. With the rippled face yes, and yeah. And I was stars. trying to think. He must be wearing something. It's not like a mask that you put on. It's almost. It was almost like he'd had it stuck really? onto his face. Really? Like, yeah. It was uh, skin tight. As it oh. Was. It looked very very good. I think that's possibly my worst type of party I could ever go to. Oh really? Why is mm. that? Well, you know me. I don't. I scare very easily. I don't like. I don't like anything. I don't like darkness too much. Don't mm. like suspense. Don't like that. Don't like being. But it was all out in the open. There was no sort of jump scare. Wasn't there? No. People hardly round corners. No. 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 There were actors, live actors, but they were out in the open. They weren't. Did you ever go on a ghost training when you were a kid and there was people actually mm. in the near? I didn't like that. Either. No. That's probably uh, probably there's a deep rooted childhood memory in all this. Yeah. That's probably why I'm scared of. Monsters and mm. things like that, and jump jumpiness. So it's not the masks as such. It's not. No, I don't think so. It's the the threat mm-hmm. of of being made to feel <clears throat> nervous. Mm. It's funny, isn't it? How fear is is something that we want to stay away from, but we're also drawn to. You know, we watch horror movies. Oh, you do. I don't. Oh, you do. Just with the <laughs> with the sound off and with subtitles on. <laughs> that is all. true. That is true. I do watch horror movies with the sound off. And but subtitles. we'll yeah we'll go on roller coasters and we'll go uh, to Halloween parties. It's adrenaline. Is it adrenaline? Is it a is it a hormonal thing? Yeah, probably. I don't know enough about it, the science of it, but I would say it's probably some kind of um, rush. Yes. Uh, also, I think possibly a you know, challenge thing. You know, that idea of challenging yourself, putting yourself outside of your comfort zone a little mm. bit. Mm. I think human beings are naturally drawn to that. There's, there is a thrill to it. There's, it's, and it's possibly the forbidden as well. Mm. The dangerous. We, don't, we, don't, we do shy away from it, but we don't. We kind of yeah, invite it. Shock. Well. Yeah. Um, I went to watch Bla- The Blair Witch Project. Have you seen The Blair Witch? So this is when I was at university. Um, this must have been 98, 99, something like that. Okay. Went to watch it on Halloween. I think right. it came out at Halloween. Mm. Um, I think I sat through it. I was very brave. Yeah. But my my girlfriend, now my wife, um, had to walk out. She couldn't sit there. She couldn't. She was too much. Is that so? That's a different. That's not a slasher movie, is it? No, like it's a nightmare on Elm Street. It's just a it's suspense. A, and it's also the, the camera, the way it's shot, and the um, the home video nature mm. of it makes it a bit more. I suppose it makes it more potentially more real. You can put yourself into that yeah. position, right? You're, it's and in the first person, isn't it? You're yeah. seeing it as that person sees it. So you don't. You know do. What's you, take, you take on that emotion that the <clears throat> the, the people in that, in that albeit fictitious movie, you mirror those emotions, mm. and you go through. That's a different type of horror, though, isn't it? That's a di- like you say. It's not there to shock you. It's there to create a similar emotion in mm. you, and that's why people can't watch it. But they do, but they go knowing that it's going to happen. Yeah, knowing that, yeah, well, yeah, you don't know how it's going to end. I think it's the relief at the end of it, isn't it? I suppose when, when, when it's over, you yeah. get that sort of different hormonal rush, don't you? That relaxing thing. But, yeah. um, I think I was going to say there. The fear, I know people, part of it is the cinematic thing about why would you go into that abandoned warehouse you know why would you do that it's just yeah. silly but when you are scared you do make bad decisions mm. um, not rational decisions yeah and I think that's you know, the, just trying to get away from the movies and back to work I suppose yeah teams that are scared people who are scared at work will make bad decisions yeah uh, you can't I, uh, in my job as a coach I, I, I can't coach somebody if they're scared mm-hmm. if they're <clears throat> if they're in the fear zone, the stress zone, mm. they, they, their mind is not open to new possibilities. You have to get them comfortable before they, they can expand their thinking, before mm. they can take on an, an alternative perspective. Mm. Everything's very laser focused and black and white, right or wrong, you know, safe or dangerous, good or bad. Um, 
and that's you know as a coach that's what I spend a lot of my time well not a lot of my time that's, that's not true but I, I, do, I do need to focus on getting and making sure that environment is safe for them to be coached in whether mm. that's an individual or whether it's a team or what have you you get scared at work? I still get a, a fear of well like tonight I'm, I'm doing so this will probably go out after I've done this mm. But I'm, do, I'm doing some public speaking tonight. I'm yeah. going to a user group in Birmingham to talk about some um, storytelling stuff. And that's fear of the unknown, fear of being judged, mm. fear of being not good enough. Mm. Um, does it scare me? Not in the same way that horror movies do, but it's, uh, you know, my pulse rate will increase. Um, and a lot of those fears... I, I, the way I calm myself down is to say, well, in reality, it's probably not going to be as bad as you think, and in this, this time tomorrow it will all be done, it will all be over with. And, uh, in the same way that you have um, fear before, uh, this, is a, this is a supposition, I'm, 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 I'm intuiting this, so the horror movie, tension, tension, anxiety, 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 finishes, oh. Yeah. a kind of nice feeling yeah. do you get a nice feeling after speaking at something yeah. like that yeah a sense of um, relief and um, yeah just that knowing that that stress the stressful period has ended mm. yeah, absolutely um, and then yeah you've got that kind of I suppose it's, it's the same type it's, uh, musicians and, and performers experience this don't they when they're on a stage you imagine, I think we've talked about this before, as a performer going onto a stage in front of 10,000 people mm-hmm. and then not being able to get to sleep because they can't bring that adrenaline level yeah. back down. Um, it does take me, yeah, you know, there'll be a sense of a high after that. How long do you reckon that lasts? I would not, <laughs> not very long. Half an hour, an hour. Okay. But then I've got to drive him afterwards, and again, just a driving will be a way to me to bring that back down to a level. Yeah. But then you think, and you, there's performers that go on the stage, and it does play with your memory as well, because if you're constantly in that state, and there's a re- repetition of doing this, you tend to, it numbs your other senses. And I hear stories about these performers that go on stage and, and they forget where they are, because they've gone to, on tour, mm-hmm. so many different venues, concert venues, different places, that they completely forget which city they're in. Yeah. Say good morning or so good evening, Newcastle, and they're, they're in Sheffield or whatever it might be. Because didn't just, you too do that? Somebody did it. Somebody famous did it on stage, and they got booed. In Australia, was something. They got something. bottles of urine thrown at them or something. Yeah. It was some some a big band did it because they've been touring so much. Yeah. But that that can happen. It can play with you, like you did, uh, your rational decision, your, mm. your your rational mind. But that's probably a fine line between tiredness and. And adrenaline. Well, I think there's also monotony in there as well, isn't there? That yeah. You get that if you're doing the same thing over and over again, you can't really distinguish one from the other. Um, whereas you're not doing that monotonously. But I would say that. So I'm. I also struggle. People really don't believe me when I say this, but I struggle with the whole uh, performance anxiety thing still. Yeah. Still now, but Still, you've, got, yeah, you've, yeah. Got a, you've made big leaps on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, my, it's my biggest sense of personal achievement that I can do these things, but it still comes at a cost. Um, but what was I saying? The monotony. It's kind of monotony. Yeah, so there's an element of, if I, if, if, I, if I became so comfortable with it, mm. it would be boring. Mm. And the fact that I know I need to... Um, you know, practice a new talk, uh, share some new information, go to a new crowd. That pushes me, and yeah, all right, it's stressful. Yeah, but it gives me. I have a different. Um, you can you have a, you can have your burnout with overstress, but you can also have your rust out, can't you? Where it's just things are too easy. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, and so it runs interesting things. So I'm pushing out. This, this talk that I'm doing tonight is largely new material. So there's an added level of fear with that. Mm. I'm, I'm saying things that I might not have said in, in public before mm. or some material exercises, whatever it might be. A lot, of, a lot of speakers at a lot of conferences I've seen will literally roll out yeah. the same message. And what I would say that 
so it sounds like you said monotonous but there's an element that people go to a Billy Joel concert mm. or a Rolling Stone Rolling Stones concert they yeah. don't want to hear new stuff they want to hear the old stuff they want to hear the old stuff yeah but we're not we're not performers people who sing along to our stuff don't they mm. really I don't know do they do, do that's a good question do some conference goers go to conferences and they'll see I won't know names, but they'll, they'll see sp- speakers say largely the same thing, mm. because and th- they just want to hear them, them say it. Maybe it's not, and that's. Uh, so I was doing some work with them. Um, I, I was invited in to give a talk at uh, a large telecoms company recently at the launch of their product, internal product telecom company. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I, I I was talking to them about making decisions and influencing people, but generally just you know learning about yourself as a product owner yeah and saying that you get this you should be you should be a little bit stressed as a product owner yeah um you should feel under a little bit of pressure because if you're not you're not going to make anything great um but this what were you saying before that i wanted a link to what you were saying oh going and seeing the same thing same thing yeah but, um, so, but one so of the things i was talking to product owners about is remember you're not your users mm. because yeah, you know, we all have our own lenses that we see things through. We all have our own yeah. biases, yeah. and assuming that everybody will use a product how I would use a product is a dangerous assumption to make. And it's something that I do a lot. And there's an example of it. I assume that people wouldn't go to a conference and want to hear the same thing. I assume that when somebody's seen me once before, they would not want to hear the same thing again, mm. and that might not be true. Mm. And I put all that effort into creating something brand new, and that might not be what people want. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which. And I also think that we tend, me and you certainly, I know that we do this, is that we, maybe there's a, a false level of expectation that people have moved on. Mm. I mean, I still regularly go to run courses now where people haven't heard of the Agile Manifesto. Mm. I mean, 18 years in advance of when it was created. Yeah. So you, you have to, sometimes I have to scale back my own expectations that people don't know that stuff yet or they haven't heard that message or that speech yeah. yet or that, that metaphor yet. There is a comfort in knowing what to expect, a big comfort. So if yeah. somebody's at a stage, yes, you on the stage, yeah. uh, we're using, I'm using the stage, perhaps literally, but also metaphorically here. Um, you on the stage, there's a pressure to perform and an anxiety, but the people being presented to have anxiety as well. If you ever go to a comedy gig and the comedian on the stage is dying, mm. Not literally Tommy Cooper esque, but you know the, the jokes aren't landing. Mm. That's an uncomfortable feeling for the crowd. Yes, um, and you know a musician that forgets their lines or something. Mm. That's that's really uncomfortable for the crowd. You know, they paid their money. They want to enjoy it. They want to see what they want to see. So there's an there's element mm-hmm. of pressure there as well. Um, and so knowing what you're going to get and getting what you know you're going to get is a comforting experience. Yeah, um, and we do a lot of work in helping people and teams and organizations change. You know, and, I, and I said to this product owner community, whether you like it or not now, whether your job title tells you this or not, you are now a leader. You are a leader in new ways of working. You're a leader in, in how to build products and how to work and how to work with people. Mm. People are gonna be paying attention to everything that you do and everything that you say. And if you, you can provide a certain level of comfort and a certain level of security by being Predictable, yeah. You know, if if I, I know what I'm going to get, I know the kind of pool. Generally speaking, I know what I'm going to get with you. Yeah. But every now and again, you will need to act differently. Yeah. And that's that's okay, and it's needed. Mm. But that being that continuity and change mm. at the same time, mm. you know, meeting people where they are, one foot in in point A and another mm. foot in point B. Mm. Right? That's that's a, a way of helping people come along with you, not expecting them to make the leap yeah. to something brand new. Mm. It doesn't make it a bit that didn't really that's a bit waffly. Does that make no, sense? No, that makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I was going to say something else about monotony. You hear it a lot, don't you? About um, there's a, there's a I suppose it's complacency, cockiness, whatever you want to call it, expecting that things will always be as you've done them before. Mm. Or developers expecting that users will always use their system in the same way, but actually how they've designed it is different to the user experience that they've, mm. they've that's evolved. Um, 
Uh, you hear that there's uh, some stories at uh, a conference a few years back, I think I saw that about um, airline pilots that don't see because they're just they're in that rhythm of how to land a plane. Yeah. I think there was a situation where they just came in to land and they didn't realise there was another plane beneath them because not, they're not looking for it. They're okay. blind spots. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But because you get so used to doing things in a certain way, to practising things a certain way, to singing the songs in the same way, that you actually get worse at doing the things that you should be mm. proficient at. Um, and it run, the other thing I was going to say is that you say about musicians on stage. Freddie Mercury, once, I think, famously said that some of the songs that the crowd loved the most were the songs that he hated the most. Okay. So imagine, try, again, you're trying to put on a good show mm. and you're trying to please the crowd but something that doesn't please you. Well, here's, here's something. So we, we, we've come full circle. Yeah. Back to masks. Yeah. So literally, pretty, mar pretty Mercury didn't wear a mask. Uh, but he did. He was a very different person. Well, not, that's not true. <laughs> He's... He, the, the media, he was out of the media spotlight when he wasn't on stage, largely. Okay. Didn't enjoy the, the media attention. Um, but yeah, and the same thing, Charlie Chaplin was very similar in terms of he, owned, he became the character mm. when by putting on that, the hat or the moustache. Yeah. He couldn't, he, he was, I think he even quoted, he couldn't think like Charlie Chaplin until he put that mask on. Mm. Um, Keith Lemon with the, the bandage mm -hmm. his alternative his, his real life what's the persona. name for that, that is it a crutch is it is it a prop what's, what's the I don't know because it's, it's it's a metaphorical mask isn't it it's a, it's a symbol yeah it's, it's a physical a, symbol yeah it allows you to it gives you permission or a, a some kind of anchor I suppose to, to get into that character so I, can't, I used to do that to a degree of, when I used to work from home at BT I used to wear a suit and tie. Well, sometimes, Did you? because it would get me into a completely different mindset. Because if I got up and I was just, I just threw a t-shirt and shorts on or something, I'd still be kind of slack. Yeah. Which, in some cases, is a good thing because I could be more creative, perhaps. That's more feel more, more relaxed and you know, free flowing. But if I, if I wanted to be more formal, more disciplined, then actually the clothes that I wore would have an impact. Yeah. So, will you be? When you're, when you're talking tonight, will you be wearing a metaphorical mask? I'll be wearing this. Or will you be you? <laughs> um, or will you be putting on a show for the audience? If, yeah, interesting. So if you asked Sabrina, mm -hmm. my wife, she would say um, it's, she can instinctively spot it when I'm in work mode. You're right. I personally, maybe I don't spot it as much or consciously do it as much. Maybe because I'm doing it more often. I don't know, but... Um, those closest to me would would probably say they can tell when I'm I do have a different persona I suppose mm. um, and that's like that is we talked about this before that's exhausting mm. to maintain two different personas mm. um, be it in work or be it even in person people we know friends of, our, of ours that we feel operate in a different fashion in front of their friends compared to how they do at home yeah. you know it's, it's um it is exhausting well i i think that's relevant in many ways but one in particular is when you when you're bringing together a team that have to work like directly consciously collaborate with people i, I always used to joke about uh, i'd rather have someone who can play nicely with others than the most talented person in the playground. Mm. But playing nicely with others takes effort. Yeah. Um, so are we asking people to, to use this metaphor of wearing a mask to be part of a team? Are we asking them to be themselves? I think... I think you, you probably have to be mindful of wearing it at different times and, and almost giving people, I think, permission to wear it. So it's the introvert, extrovert. So, so you're expecting people to speak up or to be creative in a planning session, for instance. You might want to give people permission to wear a mask, metaphorically, to be someone else, to speak as someone else, to 
um, be more confident or more comfortable left than they would perhaps would ordinarily be. But then they, they need to be able to retreat into that space afterwards. That's a safety thing. That's a pushing people outside of the safety, but then being able to retreat back into it. So I've asked my team of peer reviewers, so for, for my team mastery book that I'm writing at the moment, I've got a team of people who have volunteered to be peer reviewers. Yeah. And I've asked them to to take on different personas when reviewing okay. the work. So yeah. there are five different personas that I've asked them to, to adopt, and they can choose which ones they want to do. Uh, so the first one I've called the tube inspector, which is where they have to go through and mind the gap. So constantly looking for gaps, either in the narrative or, you know, this doesn't, there's a bit of a jump from here to here, okay. I don't see how you've got yeah. there. Um, or, you know, this, this is this missing some theory or some evidence or something. Um, so there's the professor, there's the researcher, there's the connector, um, you know, finding links and things. And then there's the one which people have jumped on the most, which is the destroyer. Oh, yeah. So I, I, I said, you know, see, when, you, when you're in this persona, I want you to find all the reasons why somebody who wouldn't, not, wouldn't like this book would use to shoot it down and say, this is, this is why this book's terrible. Yeah. And people have loved that. And they've apologised for it at times. So oh, I'm really sorry, I got carried away with this one. Yeah, that's interesting. Isn't it? But they've also been talking about it in the third person. So when they've um, been adding some comments to the, to the Trello card, uh, okay. or in the Slack channel, they've been saying, the destroyer said this. And that's the destroyer was in a bit of a bitchy mood today. Yeah. Or something like that. So they've been distancing it from themselves, which gives them permission to be mm. nasty. Um, but I think that's a safety amongst... There's probably a lack of safety amongst other reviews. So can all the other reviews see those comments? Yeah. And obviously you can see that. So there's probably a... Um, instead of saying, I think, that, that persona gives them that permission mm. to say perhaps what they wouldn't want you to know that they'd said, even yeah. though you do know that you said they, yeah, they've yeah. said it. And you can read between the lines, you know mm -hmm. that that's what they really think. And they probably know that you think that. <laughs> so that's the bizarre thing, is that that, that that persona kind of gives you... A level of abstraction. Yeah, but that's enough. Mm. In, I'd argue in stronger teams that I've seen, more mature teams, they own that level of feedback. Mm -hmm. And they know that that pers personality, almost would it, we expect that. There's people we've worked with in the same teams that we know, and they're happy to admit that they play that role. That's their natural default. Mm. They they defer to that they've got that destructive. Hat. It's cynical. Yeah, cynical. Yeah, it can, be over, over yeah, it can uh, if it's if it's constant, you can become labelled as the cynical one. Mm. But it can be very useful, and sometimes it's like we've said before, it's very easy, and it's it's an, an easy introduction to it rather than thinking creatively to think. Destructively. Destructively first. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I was quite, I tried to position it really as, as safely as I could, you know, and I said to them, I've, I've done this before, I've, I've, had, I've had people rip my books to shreds in the past. It brings me to tears, but I know it's, yeah. ne it's needed, right? Yeah. So rest assured that I will be looking at this with my big boy pants on. <laughs> um, and I'd much rather have that yeah. than release something that hasn't gone through that level of scrutiny so they're yeah. providing me a really valuable service yeah um you know and i would rather receive that feedback from a safe audience than the wider world yeah when i can't change it mm. so yeah it's uh, it, of all the five percenters that's the one that people have jumped it's on the, the easiest most. one yeah yeah one well, of the most popular one maybe not the easiest but certainly we i mean we do i think i think there's also an engineering element to this as well is that we do like to see the problems in things. Well, it's easier to, isn't it? It's easier to say it's why something see, won't work than to, to come up with a viable solution yeah. that will work. It's easier to to chip away at a list all the things that could be wrong rather than what could be right. Mm. Yeah. Is there any other links between Halloween and Agile? I think, let's say, let's talk about my wife, I always talk about my wife. She, my, Sabrina doesn't, doesn't want to, um, we have some interesting conversations around Halloween. She doesn't want to do it. She doesn't want to be associated with it. Okay, because of its pagan Because of history. its, largely because of its history. Um, and some other friends we spoke to said, uh, didn't agree with it, again, because they, they described it as pretty much begging. Yeah. You're, you're walking the streets begging people for sweets. Yeah. So they don't agree with it from that point of view. 
not from a historical point of view. But again, it's, it's, it reminds me of this whole thing around the the agility, the snake oil whole thing. Thinking mm. that people, I'm I'm pretty sure. I mean, I speak to one of my good friends who did some training last week. Um, he said he was accused in not so many words of being a snake oil salesman, okay. saying this is this isn't this can't be right. You're pushing us sort of down here. There's something that evangelizing about something mm. that, that I don't believe in. Fundamentally, don't believe in. And I still think, even even now, eighteen years on, that that is still out there. The perception that me and you as a salesman. Mm. I'm and, a terrible and, and, well, salesman. Well, in, in in the in the US in the in the, in the USA, Halloween is big bit is big money, isn't it? Halloween's massive. In Costumes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Commer- yeah. The commercial element of it is is as big as Thanksgiving. Would you say in terms of its popularity? I genuinely don't know. It's enormous. But there's a lot of money in it. Mm-hmm. People could say the same thing about our job. But I, so I, I'm focusing on a little bit of the positives here. The, um, one of the interesting things, so we're, we're not a particularly strong community where I live. Mm-hmm. We don't really know each other that well. We don't spend a lot of time. Because it's quite a transient neighbourhood. So people right. stay there for a couple of years and then leave. Yeah. Um, so we don't really know our neighbours that well. I think most people think there's not really much point because people aren't going to be there for long. We've been there for 11 years and some people will be, but most of them not. Um, and we found it an opportunity to get to talk to some of these people as they were coming around, bringing their kids around. And, um, it, was, it was a nice social mm. aspect, even though I know our kids are different ages and things. It was... It was kind of a leveller mm. in many ways because mm. every, every, everyone likes sweets yeah. or yeah. fruit. Common ground, whatever. yeah. Um, and I, I've, I've heard the begging thing before. I, I, don't, I don't get it because people are expecting it and mm. it's, it's, it's part of the fun, you know. People are expecting it. So this is something, I mean, we took our kids, I took my kids out trick-or-treating because we wouldn't do it. Um, so you say about acceptance and agreement up front mm. and I didn't realise this is a thing perhaps because I haven't been trick or treating for a while but um, pumpkins outside the door basically is acceptance that's kind of, kind of this kind of mm. around our neighbourhood in terms you of you can opt in yeah so mm. we're saying we're happy to accept trick or treaters yes. if we've got these out the door mm. and we that wasn't written down anywhere on a Facebook page for us to check that was just something we worked out as we went ok well I remember about five or six years ago there was an introduction of a sign that you could print off so right. it was distributed throughout the country if you don't want trick or treat, print this off and stick, stick it on your door. Because yeah. um, before that, people would just try and leave their wind, leave their lights off, Clo- yeah. and the curtains closed, and sit in darkness. Yeah, so they, yeah. no one's in, kind yeah. of thing. Um, but I think that the whole trick thing has fallen by the wayside. Oh, absolutely. We yeah. did years ago. We did have our house egged. I don't know why, because we were still <laughs> giving out treats. Just but because they'd run out of people. Maybe they just run out of people to throw eggs out, where it's an opportunity to throw some eggs. But yeah, you don't. That, really my kids uh, weren't. They just wanted the treats. They weren't prepared. If anyone had said trick, they my know kids would have known. Sort of, well, how does that work? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a night we are running out of time, sorry, but um, so I went trick or treating with the kids, and just to show you the level of commitment that some of the people in my neighbourhood went to, we went to walk down one street, and there was a, a toddler just in front of us who was mm. doing a few houses ahead. So they were, we were kind of following them to a degree, and they walk up to a door, and all we heard all of a sudden was boom. <laughs> Really loud, and of course, obviously, quiet at the time, don't you hear it or not. And there was <laughs> um, the owner of the house, the dad of the child who lives in the house, had dressed up as a bush. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. He had sat, he'd positioned a chair just right by his front doorstep yeah. where the kids would come right up next to him. He had completely covered himself in greenery and foliage, yeah. immersed and kind of got into a small, kind of a small ball and as soon as the child and this poor kid which has been four or five years old was and if that was me about the whole thing about being scared by horror movies I would have probably punched him in the face in absolutely scared the bejesus out of this toddler but this dad I said to him why, why are you doing this he said well I only get to do it once a year it's like he had genuinely enjoyed the whole mm. spooky jumpy suspense yeah. the thrill he did he loved that the scary element of it I'll tell you what, he was probably scared as a youngster, now he's taking it out. <laughs> it's just, yeah, the next generation. It's a deep root, is your childhood story behind that. But yeah, brilliant. Dedication to the um, to the fancy dress. Dressed as a bush. 
scare the producers out of me, honestly. All right, well, um, I think that, that brings, it, brings it to a close. Happy Halloween. It? Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> uh, until next time. Cheers, <laughs> <laughs>